the first one, direct evaluation honestly is gonna work, right? You plug in zero and you're gonna get zero times one, which is zero. So no need to manipulate if when you plug in, you immediately get a, an answer. Second one, same thing. Third one, you would get zero over zero. So this one requires obviously some manipulation. What are your thoughts here? Winter. Right, so if it's sine, you want sine of two theta over two theta, just give this a two. So times two times two, so that this will just be one. And then you're looking for the limit of two as theta approaches zero. And the answer is two. How about this guy? Oh, you were thinking identity. If it was cosine squared theta minus one, you could have used a Pythagorean identity. Josh? You take the cosine of pi over four first, which is root two over two, and then you square that. try things like, actually, Jalen couldn't use the identity on the bottom. She could replace the sine squared with it though. Cosine squared theta minus one. And then the factor factoring on top is possible. Cosine theta plus one, cosine theta minus one. And then we get the golden opportunity to cancel that. And now we can read directly evaluate. If you plug in a zero, cosine of zero is one. One plus one is two. What? Oh, you know why? We re, we, we substituted wrong. That should be what? The, the reverse order, one minus cosine squared theta, which would be one plus cosine, one minus cosine, and then that's the opposite. One minus cosine and cosine minus one would cancel, but make a negative one, so that you're right. Thank you, Stephen. But that's something that didn't come up on last night's homework, did it? I don't think we ever had to use the Pythagorean identity. Um, you know, you could try to play around with the conjugates. You could multiply the numerator and the denominator by cosine theta plus one. And like that would create an opportunity to use an identity from a different standpoint. So. Multiplying by a conjugate in trig is just another option. It would have worked in this one as well. Um, that's all I really see. Because our goal has to be getting rid of that cosine theta minus one. All right. This one is pretty typical for what's on your homework. What was on your homework. So I'm going to bypass that one. Six is as well, but six is more just in terms of variables. So... What are our thoughts on this one? Because we've got A's and B's and not numbers and so on. Steven? Whoa. 
well, even if it was 10 over 10, that's, that, we would have to work through, but our, the rule you're referring to is only with, like, number 5, where it's sine over sine. Again, I think this is kind of in real time and hearing what your initial thoughts are. This is where the overgeneralizing and the, the incessant need for, like, rules to make your life easier gets us into trouble sometimes. Um, you know, for everybody at some point, we look at it, we think it's one of those problems, but we're overlooking that difference that Josh happened to pick up on. And we're, we're all in a position sometimes where we just look quickly, me included, where you're like, oh, that's this type of problem. Let me just do it quickly and get it done. And then when you look back a second time, you're like, oh, it's because we're overgeneralizing those rules. So just with these types of AP questions, just kind of training yourself to have a more critical and almost like a more suspicious eye on things. You know, where if it seems too easy, it may, it might be just don't get in your own head, but just take a second look and double check that it's really what you thought it was. Um, but this one I would do, you have a different idea, Stephen, no? You get zero over zero. Tan of zero is zero. Nope. <laughs> you get zero over zero if you directly evaluate. 70? Yep. Just start playing around with hoping things cancel. So sine of AX over cosine of AX. And I'm going to keep the tan change the division and flip so it'll be 1 over the sine of bx. Now with this portion we can we can play around with this now. This numerator needs a bx so I'll give the denominator of bx. Yes but I don't like doing that. I know, I get, I get, I think I'm confusing it with something else and I just like to be sure. So my denominator needs an AX, so I give my numerator an AX, so this and this is gone, this and this is gone, X and X is gone, so this ends up being A over B times the cosine of AX. And now we can simplify. If you plug in zero, Cosine of zero is one, and this ends up just being A over B. <laughs> Steven, I feel like you're, you have something to say. No? Absolutely. But a lot of people are like, oh, see, my method would have worked. It was A over B. I was right. So Steven obviously knows he misread it to begin with. It did end up being A over B, so it's kind of one of those cases where he would have gotten lucky on a test for misusing a theorem. And that happens sometimes, but you can't obviously overlook that fact and just think it's always going to work out that you'll get coincidentally lucky, but it did end up being A over B. Um, 7 is going to be, well, we can kind of do it the way my alternative option was for four. So remember that our cosine x minus one rule only works when that's on the numerator. So I can't use one of these shortcuts um, with that on the denominator. I could play with that conjugate thought process that I talked about in number four. So cosine of x plus one, cosine of x plus one. I'm not going to multiply out the numerator. Uh, my denominator becomes cosine squared x minus one, which can be replaced with what? Negative sine squared, isn't it? Let me think about that again. So it's sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So cosine squared minus 1 would be a negative sine squared. So that's two signs being multiplied by each other. So I'm just going to separate that so that we can see the cancellation 
the two cancellations in the way that they're supposed to happen. The sine of x over sine of x just cancels. The limit as x approaches 0 of this portion, x over sine of x, is just 1. Or is just, no it's not, what is it? What was this? It was just one, right? Okay, so that cancels. And then we re-plug in. Cosine of x plus one, and there's that negative sign on the denominator, so we can just keep that out in front. So just plug in zero, and again we get one plus one is two, negative two. That's the one that can be flipped upside down. So, 1b was the limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine x. That was the one that can go either order as far as reciprocals are concerned. And this one goes either order as far as subtraction is concerned. And this one equals 0. Yes? Um, 8... I don't foresee any issues with that. Nine, I don't foresee any issues with that. What about 10? Let's all take a minute to think about 10. Sum and difference formulas. Where is that reference sheet? We don't have it. I like it. Kyle, what were you going to say? Kyle. Oh, no, no, no. Still only the double angle the only ones we're going to use. Um, sine of pi over 2 plus theta. This guy. Yes? Ooh, let's play with it. Okay, so that would be sine, cosine. So the sine of pi over 2, cosine of theta, plus cosine of pi over 2 sine of theta minus 1 all over theta. So this is going to cancel. Yes? Because the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So we don't have to worry about that. The sine of pi over 2 is 1, so it ends up being the cosine of theta only minus 1 over theta. And that is right here.
seven approaching zero from the right. So what are our thoughts on this one? It's technically also, if you want to look at it, sine of x over x to the one half power. What are our thoughts here? Okay, so Lily's going to try to turn this into just a plain old x. So she multiplies by x to the one-half power. So her denominator just becomes x. And that becomes one. So we have x to the one half power, and if you plug in zero, you get zero. Is that the answer? I'm suspicious of it. Is it? Was that what? What lead? Can you guess what leads me to be suspicious of it? Was anybody else suspicious for another reason? The fact that it asked that you were just coming from the right. That leads me to be suspicious because usually, and clearly not always, usually they only ask that if it's going to be different whether you come from the right or come from the left. And a typical function that's not a piecewise function is only going to be different coming from either side if it's an asymptote. So without, you know, my gut reaction honestly would have been B, play around with it a little and you get e. This is, let's just take a peek at this function. Sine of x divided by the square root of x. Window, negative 2 pi to 2 pi. Sure. Oh, now I see why it only asks from the right. Right, because from the left isn't in the domain because of the square root, right? Bingo. Yes. If you, if you could square the bottom alone, that would turn x to the 1 half into x if you squared it. But you don't square the bottom and square at the top, because then you change the fraction, you change the makeup of the problem. You have to multiply by one. So she's using the exponent rule that says when you multiply common bases, you're looking to add the exponents, and one half plus one half is one. Any other questions on this one? But but so again, and it can slip your mind, it clearly slipped mine. I'm thinking from the right, I'm thinking asymptote, but the reality is, remember that. Obviously, a denominator being zero creates an asymptote in a limited domain situation, but those radicals, x can't be a negative number. This function doesn't exist over here because we can't take the square root of a negative. That's why they only ask for the one-sided limit because it's an endpoint. Okay? So, you're, you're, you know, I wasn't wrong to be suspicious of that coming at zero from the right. I was just immediately thinking asymptote when now I got to remember to think of what if it's a limited domain altogether, if you have a radical in there. Josh? Is it on trig limits? Well, this is just a practice. It's on this packet? Oh, okay, we can go back to it. Winter, what were you going to say? Oh, you weren't. You were stretching. Okay. So... When I see sine squared, I'm going to make that sine theta, sine theta. And on the denominator, I have theta squared, so that's going to be theta times theta. So that's going to have a limit of 1. That's going to have a limit of 1. Yeah, what were you trying?
Well, you could have factored this, 1 minus cosine. You didn't do that, though, did you? Because this would have had us... The 1 minus cosine and this would have been 0. But then you still have... The, it would still have been a, a 0 over 0, which is indeterminate still. Yeah, it was that easy. Yeah. Liam, that's a bad... <laughs> and and that's, that's part of the learning process, for sure, is, is getting more used to... And the same was true for identities. You, you eventually, the more you do, the more you get a knack for it. I mean, it, there's, it's just the more practice, the more comfortable, the more confident you're going to get. And so that's why I'm taking, like, two, not learning anything new, just playing around with scenarios over the next two days to kind of just give us that time that we need and that practice that we need because it is frustrating and it's not like other maths where right off the bat I can say do this, this, and this and you're going to get the right answer. Like there's just a, a level of comfort that needs to be reached. And I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but that's the truth. <laughs> Sorry. Um, look. Okay, this one, we're going towards negative infinity. Now, up until this point, my thought for negative infinity, as you are looking for limits approaching infinity, would be asymptotes, right? I don't know that this is really going to be on the table here. Does it? Well, you can't really directly evaluate it, but I know what you're saying. Okay, so if you're plugging in negative infinity, he's saying 1 over negative infinity is going to be really close to 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1, but you're coming at it from the negative side, right? Um, which is still positive 1 anyway, so we're lucky that cosine is 1 no matter which side of zero you're on. So one minus one is zero. And then we have negative infinity times zero. Zero. Does that make sense? Um, I have this little sheet. And we'll do more of this maybe tomorrow. Um, oh, what I'm thinking of doesn't really apply to this situation, so never mind. Now, in hindsight, if you do think about the degree rules, this is over 1, right? So it's big over small. Could that horizontal asymptote rule have been used? No, right? Big over small means there's no horizontal asymptote. So this is just a totally different beast, a different category. You're in trig, so we're not thinking about horizontal asymptote rules at all. Um, so that's more of like a plug in and think it through the way Josh did. 13, obviously, through 22 are all open response. Um, some of these are direct evaluation. Some of them are asymptote type questions. Um, manipulate type questions, manipulate type questions. I think I'm going to leave you to your own on all of these because I don't see anything being... Maybe 22. That's just, everything else I could say looks like something we've done before, so it's not brand new. What are our thoughts on this one? Liam. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And then our, our limit rules say that we can find the limit of each one of these individually. So that would be the limit as x approaches 0 of this first function, which just reduces to 3, plus the limit as x approaches 0 for the sine of 2x over x, which needs some work. So this one I'd multiply by 2 and 2. This over this would just become 1. So it's just 3 plus 2, which is? So there's that binomial over a monomial idea where we can split things up and reduce individually. Jalen. Yep. So cosecant is the same as 1 over sine. And secant is the same as 1 over cosine. So this x over sine x. And now evaluate. Yeah. Okay, let's jump to. Okay. Which of the following has a jump discontinuity at zero? Now, a jump is like here to here kind of thing, right? That's what they mean by a jump. So, not just any old discontinuity, not a whole. Just a jump. Do, you, do we remember what this looks like? This one has a hole at zero, not a jump discontinuity. Yes? So if you remember the sine x over x graph, sine x, it kind of does that and then comes up and there's just a hole there which is why our limit can exist as we approach zero, but the function value obviously does not. So that's not it. This is our parent graph for a jump function. So that definitely has a discontinuity at zero. And then this function reduces to one over x, which is just a rational function. So the only one that has a jump discontinuity is two. We didn't technically do continuity in this textbook yet, but because we know it and because I was just pulling all trig things, I grabbed this one. So continuous means our function value has to equal our point value. So what is the value of b that will make this continuous? So what is the limit of this one as we approach zero? Zero. We have a hole at zero, zero. So we just need to plug this up with zero, zero. So when x is 0, b is 0. We're just plugging up that hole. Again, remember what the 1 minus cosine, what that version of this looked like? <gasps> Thank you. So remember what this function looked like, and we had a hole at 0. So essentially... We're following this function for everything but at zero, and then what are we going to put at zero to plug this hole up and make it continuous? It's got to be zero, zero. So which of the following are continuous at zero? So again, we know what this function looks like, and there was a hole there, but then are they plugging it up and making it continuous or not? Yes, they're having another point zero one, which just plugs up that hole. So that is continuous. Um, number two, we got to think about a little bit more because now we're throwing a jump function type with the absolute value in there, but also the trig. So. We're coming back to that one. I'll jump to three. 
what do we make of one minus cosine? What do we make of this one? This is the same thing as what? The square root of sine squared, right? Yes? And what is the square root of sine squared? Right, the absolute value, right? You're taking the square root of something squared, the absolute value of sine x. Um, this is, so here's the thing. With a jump function, and I'm going to show you what this looks like. Yeah, say it. I think you're about to say the right thing. The jump, the other jump functions. Yeah, just something over itself with absolute values on one. So it's still a jump function. There's no way to plug up a jump. There's, you can plug up a hole and make those continuous, but if we have these absolute values in there, these are jumps and there's no way to make them continuous. They're non-removable. So that one would be one only. So your homework is to finish the packet. Wait, we did a big chunk of it. Stephanie, not a lot.